Well, I'm so glad you're here today. I hope that you have your Bibles with you. And I want you to start with me. You may already have your Bible open here in Matthew chapter 5. We will get started there in just a minute. But I'm glad again that each of you are here. We have visitors with us. We're always thankful for our visitors. And as we, we try to say this every Sunday, if you have any questions about anything you may see or hear while you're with us, something maybe you don't understand or you've never seen before, please do not hesitate to ask. And we'll be happy to sit down and talk with you and give you a, give you a biblical answer because that's, well, that's the only right answer. We've been doing this series. I was looking on our YouTube channel yesterday as I was putting some final things together. Looking on our YouTube channel, and I was looking at this series. We've done quite a, fit, quite a few lessons on this significant biblical studies, or significant biblical phrases study. And I have you keep coming to me and say, hey, what about this? What about this? And so keep doing that. I appreciate your suggestions, your ideas, and I will turn them into lessons, and hopefully we can all benefit from them. This is one that has, well, that's prominent in the Bible. I want to start off, though. Let's talk about Jesus for just a minute. Well, let's, I tell you what, let's start here. So a lot of people in terms of religion, in terms of spirituality, faith, God, their view of God is, and you've heard me talk about this before, and I know you're, I know you're aware of this, but just thinking about it again, most people want to hone in on the love of God, the grace of God, the long-suffering, patience, mercy, kindness, goodness, all of these adjectives that tell us who God is, talk to us about the God that we serve, and all of those things are true. There's no question about that. God is love, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. No question about it. But you've also heard me say that that's a one-sided view of God. For instance, as Paul is writing to the Romans, as recorded in Romans chapter 11, really chapters 9 through 11, as he's addressing a specific problem there in the church at Rome, the Jews and Gentiles essentially are at each other within that congregation. And so in those three chapters, he, he settles the issue forever. You're all one in Christ. And this group, you don't be arrogant against this group and dismissive. And this group over here, you don't be arrogant and dismissive of, of this group. We're all in Christ. And so he would go on to say in Romans chapter 14, receive one another. That's actually Romans chapter 15 and verse 7. But receive one another as Christ has received you. In that context, in Romans chapter 11, one of the things that Paul writes is found in verse 33. He says, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. We can talk about the goodness of God, the love of God, again, mercy, kindness, all of those words that I used earlier. But if we neglect to talk about the justice of God, the anger, the fury of God, then we don't know who God is. And so many people do have that tilted view of just a God of love. Jesus talks more about hell than anyone in Scripture. And he's very specific. But it's not a great deal of content, let me say it that way. And I'm going to show you something here. I want to put this picture up, and it's probably... That actually showed up better than I thought it would. That's a, a page in the back of my Bible. I've got a... One of my Bibles has about 70 pages of lined paper like that um, that I fill up with notes. So on the left, let's see, your left-hand side, this is references from the New King James Version, which is actually, I've got this up here with me, so I don't have to keep referencing it up there or back here. On the left-hand side, you have references in the New King James Version to the word hell, and over here is the King James Version. So left is New King, right is Old King. And you will notice that there are, well, you may not be able to see it, there are 22 more uses of the word hell in the King James Version, then there are the New King James. Well, why is that? Well, because the English language has evolved over time. You and I don't speak Elizabethan English anymore. We don't speak that language anymore. And there were words not present in the English language at that time that are now. And so these more modern English versions have adapted to the evolution of the English language. And so if you were to sit down and read through your King James, again, you would find hell throughout the Old Testament. Many times um, you get to the New Testament and you would see the same thing. Again, the left hand side is the New King James. Quite a few fewer references to the word hell than there are in the King James. Well, again, it was it's all that it doesn't. That's no reflection on the Bible. It's no reflection on the King James or the New King James. It's just showing you the reality of the evolution of the English language. 
Just, just for example, um, we talk about dinosaurs. The word dinosaur was, didn't come about until, I believe it was 1841. Before that, people talked about dragons. So you know how the English language has evolved. Uh, and there are probably many, many other examples we could talk about that. But I just want you to have a picture in your mind that there are some differences in our English versions. And those are good differences. It's good to have a, a good understanding of that, to be aware of that, because let's say you have a Bible and then you decide to get a new one and it looks a little bit different. Well, that's one of the main reasons why, because languages change. Languages evolve. And it's good to be able to, good to, be able to know that. But anyway, those two bigger red boxes... Those include Matthew and Mark and James on the left-hand side, you will notice. Those are the only three books um, in the New King James that, that, use, that translate this word as hell. Now, when you look at the King James, there are many others. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, James, Second Peter, Revelation. But again, it's just a different word that, that didn't exist at that time that exists now. And that's why there are fewer references to hell. Anyway, let's get back to... The main point. I just wanted to throw that up there so you could see it for yourself. Let's talk about hell in the New Testament. I told you have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 5. Here's one thing I want you to think about. You know, I'm not the judge, thankfully, and you're not the judge. If you and I were the judges, if, if, if everybody had to stand before you, let's say, or me on the judgment day, do you know how inadequate we would be to judge even one person? So we, we see each other on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, hopefully, and Wednesday nights. We spend time together through the week. We've got ladies' class. We've got our men's class. Uh, when the ladies have their class, we men go out to eat together. By the way, that's this Thursday night, if you're able to go. So we spend time together. And then there are even, even beyond those times of our fellowship together, you may have a family here that you're closer to than others that you, you have to your home or you go out to eat and you really know each other. But let me ask you this. Do you know everything about that person? Do you spend every waking moment with that person and you know their thoughts and their motives and every action they've ever taken or everything they've ever failed to do? Of course not. You are automatically, I am automatically disqualified as a judge. God is never disqualified. We need to understand that. But sometimes we as Christians can put ourselves in the wrong place. And we need to be careful about that. That we can... Well, I'm, I'm speaking in Branson in July on, a, on a, a polishing the pulpit. And one of my topics is titled, Christians are not better, they are better off. And I'm afraid sometimes we can, as Christians, develop that mentality where we look at non-Christians and we think things like, well, Zach and I talked about this on Thursday night. We'll think of things like, boy, I just can't believe that person would ever do anything like that. I can't believe they would ever say anything. Well, maybe they don't know any better. Maybe they've never been taught. You've heard me talk about this before. We need to be very careful with who we are. I'm saying all of that to say this. The Bible tells me and you who's going to hell. Do you know that? It also tells me who's going to heaven. Now, it doesn't tell that to us as the particular individuals, that would take a lot more pages than we have in our Bibles. But the Bible is very plain on those people who will occupy, occupy this place that is called hell in eternity. The first one, as we, what I mean by the first one is as we approach the New Testament from looking from Matthew to Revelation. The first people that we are told will go to this place known as hell, which we will talk about more later, are those people who are angry at others. But we have to qualify that statement because Jesus qualifies that statement. It's not just that they're angry. It's these are people who are angry without a cause. Sometimes it's right to get angry, isn't it? Do you remember, just for, exa just for example, <clears throat> 1 Samuel chapter 17, when the, the armies of Israel are arrayed against the Philistines and Goliath's out front, and what's he doing? Well, he's defying the armies of the living God. He's insulting the Israelites He's insulting the God of heaven. And David was sent with food, wasn't he? He was sent to go see how things were going. And he got there and he hears all this going on. Do you remember what he said? Is there not a cause? All the Israelites were afraid. Saul, his brothers, everybody was afraid. David gets there and says, isn't there something that you should be doing about this? 
It's not a sin to be angry. Read your gospel accounts. How many times did Jesus get angry? Read Mark chapter 3. He looked round about on them with anger. John chapter 2, Luke chapter 21, on two different occasions in his ministry, he went into the temple and he flipped the tables and he chased people out because they were abusing the house of God. There's nothing wrong with getting angry, but you have to get angry over the right things. Look at Matthew 5:22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother, and here's the qualifying statement, without a cause. All right? There, there needs to be a righteous cause to be angry. Shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But who, Raka, what does that mean? If you're dealing with somebody and you're just full of anger and rage and you insult them, Raka in the Greek, this word is the idea of brainless, empty-headed. You're angrily insulting people. You have no control over your emotions. That's what we're dealing with here. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. You know, it is proper to call people fools when they behave like fools. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Doesn't the, doesn't the Bible say that in Psalm 14.1 and 53.1? It's not wrong to call anybody a fool if you have a cause to do so. Think about what Paul wrote to the Galatians in Galatians 3 and verse 1. Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should turn away from Christ? This is all without a cause. If you're just an angry person and you're ready to throw down, you're just always angry and, and everything is everybody else's fault, well, you're going to hell. I mean, that's what Jesus says. If you're angry with your brother without a cause, you are in danger of hell fire. The Bible tells us that very clearly. The lustful. This is what Joe read to us, so we're not going to read through that again. But you go back to that scripture reading. Those who, again, have no control uh, those who look at a woman to lust after her is where it starts in verse 28. You know, adultery doesn't just have to happen physically. It can happen with your eyes and with your mind. So if your right eye offends you, whatever it is that, that is causing you to stumble. The king, so the King James says, offend thee, in verse 29. The New King James says, I think it says causes you to sin. Is that how that reads there? Whatever the case may be. Whatever it is that's in your way that causes you to stumble into sin, the pluck your eye out doesn't mean get some type of instrument and pluck your eyeball out. Discipline yourself. Get whatever it is that is causing you to sin out of your way. Because it would be much more profitable for you to be missing whatever that is now, temporarily, than to have whatever that is now and to miss an eternity in heaven. Because if you don't do that, well, the end of verse 29 says, your whole body will be cast into hell. The lustful. How about hypocrites? Turn over to Matthew chapter 23. This word is thrown around so often. It's kind of, it's, you know, there, and there are words like that in our culture today that have been used so often as insults, attacks, um, liberal. <laughs> We've thrown that word around so much in the political realm and in the religious realm. You liberal, you conservative, you ultra conservative. We don't even, they're just things that we don't really even think about that we just say. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, people have done that same thing with hypocrites. A hypocrite was a play actor on stage who wore a mask. They played as one thing, but they were really another. That's what a hypocrite is. In this particular context, Jesus is talking, about, talking to the religious leaders of the day. He is in the temple. And he's rebuking the scribes. These are the men who were trained in the transcribing of Scripture. That's what they did. They sat down and they made copies of Scripture. The Gutenberg Press had not come along yet. They didn't have Schwegman's supplies to come and fill their toners like we do here. They had to sit down and, and letter by letter. Well, didn't Jesus talk about the jot and the tittle? Those are the smallest markings, accent markings in the Hebrew language. They copied down every letter and every jot and tittle. So the scribes and the Pharisees, the Pharisees, of course, would be your teachers of the day. Woe to you, scribes, verse 15, and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. A proselyte is a religious a convert. You're trying to turn people into you. And see, that's a problem. I don't want pe I'm not trying to turn people into followers of me as a Christian. We're not to disciple people, people after ourselves. We're to disciple people after, people after Jesus. 
That's who we're supposed to be imitating. Now, doesn't Paul say, follow me as I follow Christ? Yes. So it's not that we're not examples, but for us to be the proper examples, we have to be following the ultimate example, which is Christ. Now, these guys, they were just wanting to to, um, duplicate themselves. They wanted everybody to be just like them. That's not our goal as Christians. We want everybody to follow Jesus. You will compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, when he's just like you, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Here's what's happening. We're trying to get people to be like us, and, and then they try to get people to be like them, and then those people try to get... And you get further and further away from Jesus. We all need to be like Jesus. And if we're trying to get people to be just like me, and you're trying to get people to be just like you, well, we're, we're, we're taking the wrong approach. Go down to verse 33 here. You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? You can't. That's the point. Because they are hypocrites. You know, we have a, a lot of folks have this idea of Jesus if he was just so easygoing and so nice and kind. Um, well, I'm, I have no doubt in my mind that there were times that he was like that. But Jesus, I mean, people would read this chapter today the way our modern society is, and man, he is so mean. Well, he's telling them the truth. Is it mean to be told the truth? Well, some people would think so. Hypocrites are going to hell. The undisciplined, let's talk about that. Take your Bibles to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. We're not going to read all of these verses, but there's a repeated statement. It's in verse 44, 46, and 48, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. You've heard that phrase before. It's even used back in Isaiah. I believe it's Isaiah chapter 66. Well, what's he saying in between those statements where the worm dies, does not die and the fire is not quenched? Look at verse 43. If I hand, if I, uh, hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into, into life maimed. To be maimed means you are missing a limb. All right? And having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Verse 45, if your foot offends you, cut it off. You better watch where you go. Verse 47, if an eye offend thee, pluck it out. You better watch what you see. Watch what you put in front of yourselves. Because if you don't, if you're undisciplined. You remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9? I bring under my body, I bring myself into subjection, lest at any time I should become disqualified. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Self-discipline. But that has, to be, that has to be built upon a knowledge of God's will. What does God want me to do? What does he expect of me? And then the final time that I'm going to mention here on this particular section is James. James talks about the human tongue. All kinds of things in nature have been tamed by humans. But what's the one thing that has never been tamed? What's he say? The tongue no man has tamed. It sets on fire the course of nature. If you don't think that people gossiping about you and lying about you will set your world on fire, then you've never had it happen. If you have, and most of us probably have, you know exactly what that's like. It'll set the course of nature on fire, but then the end of that verse says, and it will be set on fire of hell. Whatever tongue is doing that, there will be, well, it will be recompensed. Let's say it that way. The Bible tells me who's going to hell. It tells me who's going to be separated from God. Let's talk about now some descriptions of hell. The Bible tells me, and I'm going to have some pictures here in a little bit, that this is a place of dark and pain. Now, fire. What We use fire to cook things, don't we? We can use fire to warm ourselves. What else do you use fire for? A source of light. But this place that we're told about in Scripture is dark. In fact, it's called outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That word gnashing, since it is a a place of pain, the, the idea of gnashing is you're grinding your teeth in pain. Those verses reference that. If you want to, if you make notes, you can write those down. We're told that it's a place that is eternal. And I like this passage. And the reason that I like this passage, and I'll kind of bring it back around at the end, 
is because of what Jesus says here in Matthew 25, 41. He shall say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. <clears throat> God did not prepare hell to send those there who were created in his own image. And that's me and you. He prepared it for the devil and his angels. How that happened, when, and what, that's, that's a whole other discussion. But that's what Jesus says. Now, why do people go to hell? Because they, they begin acting like the devil and his angels. They lie. They're hypocrites. All those things that we just talked about. They're undisciplined. Whatever the case may be. Then you look at verse 46. These shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. If you believe in heaven, think about it this way. If you believe that there's a place called heaven where there are angels and where it's God's throne and where Jesus is and the Holy Spirit and God the Father, all of that is there. And you believe in the God that's on that throne. And again, his love and justice and mercy, you have to believe in hell. Because a righteous God does not permit sin to go unpunished. If you believe in eternal life, you have to believe in eternal condemnation. Number one, that's the way the Bible presents it. But number two, that makes perfect sense in view of the, <clears throat> in view of the, the essence of God. Hell is a place of eternal suffering, darkness, and pain. There is not one good person in that place. You think about the world we live in right now. Many of you grew up here, have been here your whole lives, and probably will be. And that's, there's not a thing in the world wrong with that. I'm, I'm born and raised in Ohio. I lived there till I was 16. Lived in Tennessee for 10 years, Florida for 8, been here for 10 years. There are good people all over the world, aren't there? If you've traveled. And you know, that's something else to think about. If you're a Christian and you're traveling, anywhere you go, you can find a group of God's people, can't you? You can find a place to worship with brothers and sisters in Christ anywhere in the world. This world is full of good people. But you know just as well as I do that this world is full of evil people, too. But when the Bible talks to me about this place called hell, there is not one good person there. There is not one good thing there. Let's go to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. Revelation 21, 8. You know, we have to, again, we have to deal with our share here. Good people, sometimes not so nice people, and then people who are just evil. Evil is real. Revelation 21, 8. But the fearful, most of, your, most of your versions say that. The Greek word here is for timidity, the cowards, cowardly people. Unbelievers, the abominable murderers. The King James says whoremongers, fornicators is the right. For us today, that's the word that would be used, fornicators. People who just live for sexual satisfaction, it's that idea. Sorcerers. Uh, I'll talk about that in just a minute. Idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. See, we're all going to die once. We know that. But there's a second death. That if you're in this category, you're going to suffer. Here's a, some alternate translations of these words here. They're timid, disbelievers. These, they're, they're people who cannot, who will not be convinced by the truth of the gospel. And Jesus even dealt with people like that. The third word there, the abominable, that's a word we don't typically use today, disgusting. There are people in this world who do some disgusting things, aren't there? That's what that word means. Murderers, fornicators, we know what that means. Sorcerers, that's an interesting word. We get our English word pharmaceuticals from this term in the Greek language. Drug users, hallucinogens, people who alter the state of their mind through things like that, intoxicants, etc. Idol worshippers, people who lie, that's pretty straightforward. And that's the point. There is not one good person or thing in hell. It's dark, and yet it's full of fire. It's painful, and it's eternal. On top of that, there is no rest. Turn your Bibles back to Revelation chapter 14 for just a minute. Revelation chapter 14, verses 10 and 11. I know there are times, all of us go through this, where we'll be in a project, we'll be doing something, or something will come up, and it just consumes our calendar, consumes all of our energy, our thoughts, and you're just worn out at the end of the day. 
But you know what you get to do typically at the end of the day or sometime? You get to take a nap. You get to go to bed, rest, you know, rejuvenate. Revelation 14 is talking about those who worship the beast in his image. The same, those people, shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Extremely vivid language there. They would mix typically in the first century when they had some type of, we might say, fruit of the vine, wine product, whatever the case may be. They would dilute it. It would go further. It wouldn't be as strong. Well, when, it, when we're talking about God's judgment against the sinful, it is undiluted. It is pure wrath. Unmixed. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. In the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they shall have no rest day nor night who worship the image, uh, who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So we're going through Revelation on Sunday nights. We're going to get to that chapter. I don't want to deal with it right now. But the point being here, this is a place of no rest. N no relief. No comfort. Not one good thing. What about this brimstone? We hear about fire and brimstone, don't we? Do you know what that means? Have you ever done a, a word study on what brimstone is? Something interesting to think about. Brimstone literally means sulfur. A sulfurous smoking flame. Now here's a picture. That's okay. It's a yellow substance of sulfur. When you burn sulfur... In light, you can't really see it, but there's a blue flame. That helps me understand, to an extent, how hell is a place of outer darkness with flame. It's there, but it's not for a source of light. If you were to, let's say you were to go into a strange place, a place you had never been before, at night, and there was no power, you had no flashlight. You didn't have your phone screen to light your way. Would you be very comfortable in that place trying to navigate? That would be rather uncomfortable. And you don't know what's in there? That's kind of the description of hell. It's a place of fire and torment. But this idea of brimstone is, yes, it's, it's a flame. It's a sulfurous flame, but it's not for the production of light. It's for heat, so far as I can tell. That's what it looks like when it melts. It turns orangish and red. Does that sound very pleasant to you? See, fire and brimstone is not just a catchphrase that we use for sermons. This is a place that exists. This is a place that, well, thinking back to Matthew 25, 41, that God prepared, again, not for those that he created in his own image but for the devil and his angels because of their pride and sin. But we, you and I, are warned about it repeatedly. This is how it could be a place of eternal flame, yet dark, outer darkness, no light and no hope. So now, what do you do with that? When I was preaching in Pensacola, uh, <laughs> We had somebody that we were very close to. Uh, it was one of the elders and his wife, and many of you met him, helped us move up here, Billy and Kim. But we, I, I don't even remember how it developed, but we had this kind of a running joke of I would preach a sermon or whatever, and afterwards he would come up to me and say, man, that was a good sermon. I'm glad this person was here to hear it. That's the way sometimes we view preaching. But And th this goes for all of us. This doesn't... These topics that we're dealing with, the topic of hell, whatever topic it may be, it doesn't just, I'm not up here preaching at you. That's not my job to get you told. But that's what sometimes we do with sermons is we need to hear this sermon. Oh, not for me. Everybody else needs to hear this. Folks, we all need to hear this. There is heaven and there is hell. But here's the good thing. Is there... How do you close with good news? Well, the, the fact of the matter is this. You don't have to go there. We're told about it. We're warned about it. We're told the type of people that will go there. 
And the same book that gives us all that information, turn your Bibles, by the way, to Romans chapter 2, the same book that gives us all of those details gives us this information. We're going to read verses 5 through 11, and then we'll close. Romans 2, 5 through 11. The preaching of the gospel is for the preacher and for everybody that hears it. We need to understand that. We need to make application to ourselves first. So many people are worried about everybody else and not so much about themselves. Okay. Romans 2, 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath... Against the, ray of, against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. I love that phrase at the end of verse 5. The righteous judgment of God. He is not going to get anything wrong when it comes to judgment. Good or bad. He's not going to miss a, a thing. Who will render to every man according to his deeds. See, God's not going to judge us based off of what somebody else has done or not done. You and I each, we are all going to be judged based on our own deeds. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Why is that the case? Well, let's finish here, verse 10. But glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good. Why is it the case that he says twice in this text, to the Jew first and also to the Greek? Because of verse 11. The King James says, for there is no respect of persons with God. I prefer the New King James. God shows no partiality. He doesn't have his favorites. Just admit it. We have our favorites, don't we? That we that's a, a tendency of human nature is we have people that we are closer to. We have pe- people of whom we think more than others. And it's not that we are hypocritically judgmental or anything like that. That's just the nature of life. You get along with some people better than you do others. There is no partiality with God. There is no favoritism with God. You do those things that were good and honorable that's listed in that text, that's immortality and eternal life. You do those things that are evil, that's indignation and wrath. And I guess part of the the good news of that is you and I get to choose that. It's it's, It's not assigned to us from all eternity as so many of our religious friends believe that you have the elect and you have the non elect and there's just there's nothing you can do about either side. That's not biblical at all. There's nowhere in Scripture that that's taught. But what is taught is each man will be judged according to his own deeds. 2 Corinthians 5.10, Romans chapter 2, verses 5-11. through 11, So many passages teach that. Romans 2.11, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 9, Colossians chapter 4, and I can't remember the verse right now, but Colossians, all these verses tell me that there is no partiality with God. If you want to go to heaven, you submit yourself to His will. You do what he says. And if you don't do that, well, there's an alternative. There's an alternative to heaven. And that's that place that burns with fire and brimstone. That's that place of no rest, of no comfort, where, no, not, where not one good thing is, where you're separate. Paul says it like this in 2 Thessalonians 1, where you are separated from God, from the presence of God and the glory of his power. But the choice is in your hands. That's the good news. And besides that, the, the, I guess the bigger good news is we have Scripture. We have God's Word that tells us all of that, everything we've talked about this morning, but then it tells us things like God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You can come to faith in Christ and avoid an eternity in hell. But that's not all. There's not one thing alone that saves you. Are you saved by faith? We've done this before. Are we saved by faith? Absolutely. Are you saved by faith alone? There's not one passage of Scripture that tells us that. You've got to repent of your sins, don't you? 
You've got to make that great confession. And one of the things that we're told in Scripture by Jesus and Peter and Paul and all of these writers of the New Testament is that you need to be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. And when you submit your will to God's will and you live the faithful Christian life thereafter, you have a hope of heaven. You, you have eternal life now, but you have the hope of an eternity in heaven with the Father. Now, the alternative to that is, and this goes back to Revelation 21.8, the non-believers, remember? The, un, the unbelievers. If you reject the gospel and refuse to live by God's revealed will, well, there's, there's an eternity for that too. And it's, it's called hell. It's the lake that burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death, Revelation 21, verse 8. God has done everything he can do to save you. He's written it down for us. Now, we either submit to that or we don't. If there's anything that we can do for you here today, if you've never obeyed the gospel, if you have never put Christ on in baptism, if you have questions about that, don't hesitate to ask. Maybe you're here today and you've never done those things. You've never confessed your faith in Christ. You've never been baptized or you, you have done those things, but you've not remained faithful to those things. Let's come back today. If there's anything that we can help you with, why don't you let us know as we stand and sing.